Welcome to the Destination Next podcast. This is a podcast hosted by me, Chris Hall, in collaboration with Sturka. With this podcast, we're going to be celebrating everything endurance, supporting the everyday athlete who are maybe not necessarily in the limelight. People are now going further, faster and better on the products they're training with and with the equipment they've got. Sturka offer a range of nutritional, carbohydrate-based products that are vegan and super friendly on your stomach. And you can use discount code NEXT10 at www.sterka.com to get 10% off your next order. It's funny you bring up Blue Monday because Blue Monday is marketing bollocks. <laughs> do, you know, do you know the story behind it? Do you actually know the story behind Blue Monday? I don't. Enlighten me. Okay, so... It was set up, I think, I can't remember if it was 95 or 2005, something with a five at the end of it, or 20, it might have even been 2015. It's one of them. It's definitely got a five at the end of it. Um, a travel company started it as a like a promotional thing, saying, oh, you know, there's no science or truth behind it at all. The, the, the Their argument was that it's the furthest, it, in terms of like, time after christmas it's the time that you allegedly start to go oh fuck it's the year but the reality of it is it's basically a marketing a marketing ploy from a travel agency to try and sell holidays and flights that's how it started and it's kind Mm. of like escalated a little bit so effectively it's like it's kind of like the really shit version of valentine's day or mum's day or dad's day which is like just a marketing yeah. holiday. Or, or I'm going to even put it out there. Halloween, to an extent, it's a marketing holiday. You know, it's a way to sell. I can't go down the religious holiday route. All right, I'm not religious, but I'm not going to go down that route either. But anyway, you get the gist. It's basically a made-up thing. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll have to tell Charlie I'm taking her away for Blue Monday. <laughs> <laughs> the theory. I mean, I get the theory of it. I get the theory of it that it's like a. Um, it, 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 in theory, it makes sense that it's kind of the fair, a, a far enough time after Christmas and New Year's that people are kind of like settling into the new year, maybe reassessing things that have happened over uh, 2022 and going, oh, I didn't do this, I did do this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, maybe it's that point where people are starting to think about all that kind of stuff. But yeah, Blue Monday is bollocks. They're going to end it there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way. That's a good way to start and end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and in case you didn't know, I do not give a shit about swearing in a podcast. <laughs> that's fine by me. Good. Because I am a big believer that people that swear are not trying to hide anything. They're just being honest and saying things as they are. I think it's very true. But any, yeah. any, anyway, I could digress for a long time. This is Ed. Ed's a very lovely man. I've known Ed for... We've sort of spoken on and off for, I don't know, quite a few years now, a while. And if you don't know Ed, Ed has a fantastic YouTube channel, first of all. Ed also happens to be pretty pretty savvy on a bike. I'm not, I don't want to pick you up too much, but you have had two national jerseys, if I'm correct. Yeah, in almost two different sides of the sport. Not quite two different separate disciplines, but yeah, they so kind you, of they're not exactly the same, but yeah. So one one was in the British Unicycle Championship, <laughs> and one was in the British Penny Thar- Farthing Championship. Yeah, it was close. Yeah, <laughs> no. I'll give you, I'll give you that one. Yeah, one was a junior crit. It was that is close. It was under twenty three. Um, well, actually, under twenty three road race champion um, in the. So this this was when the under twenty threes were mixed with the elite men, mm. and um, yeah, we we raced this. This actual race was in uh, Abergavenny. So my home country, uh, Wales, and it was a pretty epic race. And if anybody watches, you know, the UK road race championships, they'll know that it's like basically eyeballs out from the start and whoever's left at the end is sort of left at the end. And that race was exactly the same. And it was just like 
you know, the likes of David Miller, the likes of Cavendish, um, Pete Kenner, there was uh, Luke Rowe, G, virtually all of them, you know, inside the top 10. And I think I finished just outside the top 10, but I was first under 23. So that's how it worked. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, the other jersey was a bit more recent in 2019, and that was for the British Hill Climb Championships. And uh, for anyone that doesn't understand, because hill climbing is such a British thing, it is such a British thing. And like, I've tried to translate and explain this to people in America, and there is like a similar kind of thing, but it's it's not the same. Uh, Anyone that doesn't understand or fully understand the hill climbing is basically you start at the bottom of hill, you ride up it as hard as you can, and probably collapse, maybe throw up, most likely taste blood in your mouth at the top. Is that a good way of summing it up? Yeah, it's a perfect way of summing it up. Um, and I and I think there's such a variety as well in the UK uh, with the um, with the length of the climbs, albeit the shorter ones are a bit more um, well attended. They're a little bit more uh, well both well attended in in fans and well attended in entries. Um, but there's certainly the longer ones. Like, you know, you had a taste last year of, of the struggle, which, you know, would be classed as one of the longer ones. Um, basically anything over 10 minutes for the winner would be classed, I suppose, as a longer hill climb. But I know, you know, if you're talking to American folk um, or even like any European uh, really would class that as a very short hill climb. Um, but yeah, there's a, a a real mix. It's a fascinating thing. As you say, like there's obviously there's an element of being very specific to hill climbing, but then there's the niches inside of hill climbing, as you say, where a longer, a longer circuit might suit a certain rider. A shorter one might suit a more explosive rider. Like it's such... It's, it is like a niche in a niche in a niche in a niche of cycling. But the bit that makes it so incredible is the, from my experience, like, so I, I've done the Swains Lane one, which is a short, I would say is a pretty damn short hill climb. Um, and I've done the struggle last year, which was the Swains Lane one was, that was a cool experience, but the struggle was genuinely one of the best experiences I've ever had on the bike because it's very hard to explain, but I've never done something where there's been people cheering for the majority of a climb going up it. Like I can only imagine like doing the national champs is just a different, a whole different ball game, but like on the struggle, like it was, you know, it was a pretty, I believe it was, I don't know if it was sold out or not, but there was, it was the rides were going all day for a long time. And uh, the crowds were on the climb for, you know, I mean, the bottom half of that climb maybe wasn't so busy, but like from the, you've got the like little descent and then the lip up again from that descent or just before that descent, it was just littered with people shouting and cheering. And I've, I've never, ever, ever ridden through something like that. I was like, I'm fucking Chris through. I'm Chris through. <laughs> I'm I'm winning the Tour de France. It's incredible. It's absolutely <laughs> incredible. Like, I yeah. couldn't, couldn't explain that th- feeling to anyone. And then, you know, I think the day that I did it, so I had the British gravel champs the day before. And uh, so I was I turned up. I, I did the gravel champs on the Saturday, which is in like Norfolk way. And then drove home, well, drove there in the morning, drove home straight afterwards. The gravel champs was like full gas. Like it was, it was ridiculous. And then I dropped a chain and I was like, oh, well, that's a shame. I could just spin around and enjoy the rest of this now. And um, then, yeah, drove back home to where I am in the Peak Districts afterwards, which conveniently is kind of, was actually the location wise, it was kind of a couple of hours each way from uh, Gravel Champs to mine and then from mine to the struggle. And then drove to the struggle the next morning and I turned up and Toby, who does Cold Dark, Dark North stuff, was like, are you all right, mate? And I was like, oh, I am so tired, <laughs> like just aching. And he was like, what are you thinking? I was like, anything under 20 minutes is a win, to be honest. <laughs> and um, I think I was like 16, 16 minutes, something like that. Um, 
Um, it's, it's funny how you mentioned the um the the fatigue there because like the the traveling is a is a side of it that I think um it is very underappreciated and that's not just in the hill climbing that that can be in you know every aspect of the sport of cycling it's um it, when I was racing you know quote unquote professionally um that was something that was driven into me in my first year was if you can handle the traveling you can you can be a professional cyclist mm. um it was one of the things that like if you had like um a job description uh for a professional cyclist you could say like oh six watts per kilo ftp yeah no problem but can you travel x amount of days every year and like you know sleep in every sort of position you could think of um because you're going to be on a bus or on a plane or you know you're going to be eating airplane food you're going to be you know it's all this kind of stuff that you don't um that you don't think about but well obviously elite team wise or world tour team wise they get different kind of support but um you know the likes of us traveling to weekend races you know when we're stopping at a motorway services and just getting whatever we can then that's not like that's not like the best of the best but um but yeah, um, I mean those Big Macs aren't the best for nutrition, right? <laughs> I wouldn't know, Chris. <laughs> uh, I, well, I'm a vegetarian, so I'd look at it and go. Nah, anyway. <laughs> but there's a, there's you. It's a that's a very good point, and and it's something that I think, even on an amateur level, people don't think about that side of it. Like traveling, I I find that I need especially if I'm going like abroad and doing a race abroad, I need like three or four days beforehand because I just feel super slug. Doesn't it, even if it's in like Europe and it's an hour different time zone, I just always feel sluggish after flying, really sluggish. And it's the same at Badlands the, uh, last year. So I got there, I think I, did, I only gave myself like two days before, which is not great in the terms of being there in advance for my for me and I felt terrible when I landed because I've you know got an early flight flight departs at like half seven in the morning so you're there at some crazy time in the morning got to the Airbnb that we were staying in and I just was like I'm gonna go have a sleep feel awful build the bike up and everyone else was like oh we'll go for a ride and I was like cool I'm going to bed see you later have a little power nap yeah. um but, but it, people do forget about that side of it like it does even if it's whether it's driving or flying or whatever it is, it does seem to really sap it out of you. Um, and it's a good point that actually being able to cope with that is kind of like, it's quite, that definitely can be a benefit I'd imagine. And, and, and as you say, the world tour riders, they, they just get treated in a whole different perspective. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how much truth there is in this, um, but I was told uh, a good few years ago that it takes approximately one day to adjust to each time zone you cross. Um, and so further in my career, when we were doing like the tour of Japan, um, the tour of Korea, uh, and a couple of times when we flew to Australia, mm -hmm. um, but particularly like the tour of Japan, you'd want to get there like, you know, four days in advance if you could. But like even then, that wouldn't be um, totally ideal because not only would you still be jet lagged, but you know you haven't got time, even got time to get used to the food. Um, but like, we would fly there. We'd like immediately trying to adjust the time zone. If we could, we would like build the bikes to keep ourselves awake and then we'd go for a bike ride like late afternoon if we landed sort of midday-ish or whatever it was um but we would be straight into like a seven day stage race um like two or three days after landing and be expected or not expected because like the pressure when you're at that level is is sort of you put a lot of pressure on yourself because you want to progress. You want to move up from continental level. Cause that was the level I was racing at. Mm. Um, you know, want to progress the world to on things. So you want to pull a result out, but you know, the managers and the staff and things, obviously they want you to pull a result because they want to see you progress as well. Yeah, um, yeah. that's, that's what it's like racing at, at that sort of level. So, um, yeah, like learning to perform in 
suboptimal conditions, I suppose you could call it, like landing three days immediately into a seven day stage race. And you always seem to find yourself coming good, like sort of stage five of, mm. of, of the seven stages, um, because you finally like started to have good sleep or, you know, undisrupted sleep. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was a time I look back on with fond memories actually. <laughs> Hmm. but how did um like when you were doing that did i mean i'm guess i'm presuming you would but did you really feel the pressure from the team in that context of like shit i've actually got to do it, taking away the fact you're traveling the other side of the world because i'd imagine there's an element of understanding in that that you are traveling and th- there is jet lag and stuff but did you ever feel like any of the teams in particular you don't have to say who but was there any, any ever points where you were like shit i really gotta like do something here I think, um, I wouldn't say I was lucky, but there wasn't very many opportunities that I had to quote unquote lead the team. Mm. Um, It wasn't until like later in my career in like 2017, 2018, where I was sort of started to come into my own and I was also discovering my ability as a climber then as well. So any of the races we went to, which were actually the longer, like the seven day things, um, or the really hilly one day races where there would be a re- real wearing down effect on on the bunch. Um, it was only then I would feel the pressure, but I didn't get that many opportunities to feel it. But it wasn't so much like you wouldn't feel the pressure beforehand because you know, the manager would always know how to talk to you. I was the type of person who would like to be like, I didn't do well if someone was like slapping me across the back and say, come on, let's go, let's, let's go and do that. Let's go and win that. I wasn't that type of person. It was more like, like, let's just take it to the side. Like, this is the job today. This is what I think you can do. I believe in you, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, So it was more like afterwards, like if I hadn't, achieved what was expected Mm. um then it came sort of raining down um and that you almost felt the pressure after it which is kind of weird like because Mm. you put the pressure on yourself then for the next event or the next race Mm. it's a really interesting one you say about the pressure afterwards because i i did a an interview some point last week with ruler and it was talking about the whole interview was about um post event or challenge or race blues like the come down afterwards and uh they were and the first thing when i when i was talking to the it's just called india i was talking to india about it was she was like the first thing i said to her was like to be honest the person you should be talking to about this is my partner not more so than me or you know, my best mate, because they're the ones that have to deal with that come down more than anyone. I just kind of accept it and probably am a, a grumpy twat. I'm about to know I am just grumpy and miserable, but they're the ones that have to deal with it. And it's, that's where, and that's where I think it's important. And I think I always found after any of the challenges and stuff I've done, it, it depends on it, but like I referred quite a lot to when I was talking to her about the seven Everests and I said to her, like, I said, even though, you know, I managed what, I think it was like 94% of the total elevation, which considering the conditions and everything, I was ecstatic about. Um, some people would say, oh, you didn't achieve it. But then on the flip side, I'd be like, well, it wasn't actually about necessarily achieving it. It was about the conversations and stuff that came out of it. But um, the fallout after that challenge was like astronomical, like the worst I've ever had, like, where it was nasty it was really nasty and we we kind of preempted it by booking a holiday straight up like literally three days afterwards going away for a week to athens um which was good but the the problem i found on what i find is the moment there's something which ends up with a lot of i guess media or exposure on it that the effect of it afterwards doesn't matter if it's success or not that then puts pressure onto what's next. And that's where I struggle. And I and I kind of like I I, I kind of planned it that the next thing really wasn't that until Badlands. There was a few, like I rode to Switzerland, I did a couple of bits and bobs here and there, but the next thing was Badlands, which was, you know, 
four months away, really. Plenty of time to kind of not overthink about it. But I definitely found that if there's something that's had a lot of exposure and media and eyes looking at it, there's that pressure of that expectation of what's next is the worst. It's horrible. It's really horrible. That's mm. why people ask me what's next. I never say generally. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next, Chris? Um... <laughs> Atlas Mountain Race. <laughs> Fine. Everyone I, knows that one. I, I love I love the fact you just like quickly mentioned in amongst that that you'd r- just ridden to Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it just came to my mind. I remember the I remember seeing it. And um yeah, I mean I mean massive respect for the the you know the the whole riding on, on Stuland Dam. That was that was something else because that was actually the same weekend because I reached out to you then um because I was doing a a bike race around Wales. Yeah, yeah, you were, you? Yeah. Uh and it was so slight like tangent the bike race around wales was going to start in chepstow and it was going to follow um it was going to head uh towards the Pembroke coast and basically follow the whole course around wales so i wouldn't have been that far away from you at one point so i was going to kind of like go off track and sort of give you a wave um but um but i actually pulled out before that happened uh with a bit of a knee niggle but that i can relate to the the come down um i never had that when i was racing because i, I almost always had like another another race and it was yeah. like okay i focus on that race focus on that race and then when the end of the season came you had nothing to do well the sort of the come down was well i'm just gonna have like a couple of weeks off the bike anyway so there kind of was no come down but i've definitely found that to be true now with like um you know last year in april going to Mallorca, going to Sacalobra and testing myself on there and then coming away with that like KOM that I really sort of didn't expect the internet to respond the way that it did. But then it blew up. It, blew up. it completely blew up. Yeah. And then it blew up again uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, when 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 Pitcock uh, blitzed it, which is great for me. Um <laughs> but it there was a huge come down after that because I was in like pretty, well, I wasn't in pretty decent shape. I was in pretty good shape um, to, to do that effort on, on Sacralobra, but um, coming back home, you know, to wet and windy wheels, even though it was like May, it's still like pretty rough here. Yeah. And like, I was thinking to myself, okay, I've done that. Now, where do I keep the momentum? Like, what do I do now? And then I had a bit of a health scare um, actually straight after that um, ride around wheels um, where I, I peed blood. And I actually found out later that it was potentially um, like a tear from either dehydration or can be from strain. And I hear it happens a lot with runners. Yeah. Um, and funny enough, when I, when I sort of opened up a boat, cause I, I, I went a bit, I went on a bit of a, a downer, shall we say after that, because of the, like I said, I'd lost all that momentum mm. uh, and lots of people reached out to me and said that they'd had a similar thing. And I was like, you know, it's funny how, when you do open up, there's so many people in the same situation. And yet, yeah. like, if you don't, you just have no idea. You just think you're the only one. And it's it's like it's not this daft, but it's like it it it's sometimes like it's sometimes the blooming obvious when you think you know when you talk to people it becomes so much easier. Mm. Um, and I know you do you know a lot of work around that, and that's brilliant. Um, I think a lot of what happens is, um, we not just in cycling, people generally, you focus on a goal or a target. It doesn't matter what that goal or target is. But the moment, even if you've got something planned after that goal or target, the moment you've done that goal or target, there is, there is, there's always going to be an emptiness that's left behind because it's something that you focused on for, it could be years, you know, it could be weeks, months, years, whatever it is, but it's something that's taken up a lot of your physical and mental energy for a very long period of time you know, something that's causing you not to sleep well at night, whatever it is. And 
that emptiness is almost in a way a bit like mourning for it. It's a really weird way of thinking about it. That's how I try and think about it, that you're almost mourning for something that you shouldn't really mourn for, but you've realized that it's gone. Whatever it is, it's gone. It's done. And some people, and the whole opening up thing, I, 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 I really, in the past, have really struggled with depression really, really badly. And it was really bad when I was like early 20s when I worked in architecture. And now I, I'm, I'm pretty good in that context. Like I don't tend to struggle so much about it. But the one I struggle with is anxiety. I get really anxious about things. And I, I think doing bikepacking races in other countries does not is not good for that. It really isn't good for anxiety. Um, but equally to you, the opening up and exposing yourself to it, the thing that you and I have to remember, and and I mean this not in an arrogant way, I mean this in a humble, good way, is that we're both people that other people are looking up to because of what we're doing. And, you know, we're very openly putting ourselves out there and what we're doing and what we're trying to do and attempting to do uh, and trying to make a job out of it, all that kind of thing. And there's a lot of people who are never in that position to be able to do that or whether that's, uh, you know, financially, whether that's, you know, life commitments, families, et cetera, et cetera, that haven't got the ability to do that, but would love to do it. And I'm a big believer that if you, people like yourself, myself, or if pro riders, anyone else who someone looks up to in some way can open up and be really honest about that kind of thing. Ultimately, that is better for it. There's a trickle down effect that comes from that, which helps so many people much more people you think of there's one or say there's like i don't know five or ten people that reach out and say like thanks for that there's going to be a hundred people that won't you know yeah and because they don't they for whatever reason they might not reach out they might not feel confident are talking about it etc etc like i saw someone i'm not sure who it was someone who's racing at the tour down under in the in the women's tour down under was talking about um what was she talking about? It was really openly talking about, oh, saddle sores. And as a woman having really bad saddle sores and the issues she's had and the operations she's had. And she's like uh, very openly talking about it around the tour down under. And I was like, that is, that's good. Because to hear, you know, a top level rider being open and honest about that, who races at the top is, you know, she's someone that raced for, uh, she raced for Jayco Alula or whatever it's called now. Mm someone who races that team just being so open about it and i was like that's great because fuck 90 percent of people who cycle struggle with saddle sores at some point there's never going to be someone that never has that issue and i don't think um but yeah anyway i've gone on a bit of a tangent like i i ultimately i think uh opening up about the come downs um struggles like peeing blood those kind of things it what we may not necessarily realize is that helps so many more people than it's not just us like outwardly portraying something it actually helps other people by giving them something to understand that this is normal this is you know it's not all fucking sunshine rainbows and daffodils or anything you know yeah no true true the the irony was like you know after after that um bit of a scare and obviously i you know, went to uh, went to my doctor, got myself checked out. Uh, at, it was it was quite thorough actually, and I ended up giving about three urine samples as well in the space of three weeks or whatever it was. Well, there and was then, three to one. That's hard. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and then we ended up going to out to France because I was I was sort of in two minds whether or not to do that because of um because it was so like um so raw still um and went out to france did the whole route but i was like i'm not going to push myself i'm just going to ride it and like do a couple of videos and just use it as like a bit of a holiday but you know as the days went on while i was out there i was like i'm feeling fine and you know i've been given the all clear i'm not peeing blood anymore um i'm a big believer in like how you feel um you know i know there's a lot of metrics nowadays like you know heart rate variability and like 
you know all these sorts of things um wearables and whatnot and I, I, i'm as much as i believe in that i'm still a big believer in how you feel mm-hmm. um uh, and when i when i went out there a lot of people are telling me um you know go out there and see how you feel just ride your bike and just relax so i went out there did the hot route and you know, not once did I think about it. And that was one of the problems with me was that I was thinking about it too much. I was overthinking the fact that I just had, you know, a bit of a scare and I had nothing else to focus on mm. while I was sat here in the flat other than that. And that was not good for me. Um, And so when I went out there and I did that, I had that other thing to think about. And even though it wasn't a focus then, as in performance wise, um, it was me just living life or carrying on with life that then helped me progress out of you know what was like a bit of um unbalanced couple of weeks you know where I didn't know what I was going to do where I was going to go um and that that's kind of what turned turned the year around a little bit but it certainly made me reflect and made me think about like how how can I do things better in 2023 like I'm I'm not going to, you know, put a lot of weight on myself to do this one thing and then try and do like other big, massive things, you know, especially I think when, well, particularly with YouTube, for example, because you're, you know, there's so much content out there that you think, oh, I need to make a viral video or I need to do this. I need to do that. And then you lose your way a little bit and then you don't make anything because you're overthinking it. And I, that's where I've just, in 2023, I've just thought to myself, I want to do what I did last year, but not to the same extent where I like, not so much burn myself out, but I put a lot of pressure on myself to do it at the perfect time. Because that's that's something that I've always like bogged, got bogged down in is, is, you know, when's the perfect time to do it? I need to be in perfect shape to do it. I need to... You know, I need to be doing this in July because that's when I'm going to be at my strongest. You know, I think this year I just need to do it. Um, and later, uh, what I heard like good quote, something like later could be never. Um, uh, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm not going to say like, oh yeah, I'll do it in July because, you know, I'll be fitter then. I think, you know, that's putting pressure on myself to then be ready for July. And I think just going with it uh, is going to be my plan for 2023. That's a good way of doing it. Like, I think my, it depends on the perspective you go of it as well. Because I think when I was doing the, like the national 24s, that was the, that was the target for the year. And whatever else happened in the year was basically everything leading up to national 24 was just like, all progressing towards it and then anything afterwards was for fun and because it meant the reason normally was was like you know national 24 is july i think i don't even remember now and similarly you know you're trying to peak for that one race of the year so you, there's lots of time trialing coming up to it but the amount of hours spent on a time trial bike as well that's the thing with that race is just hours on a tt bike and the irony is now all of my turbo stuff I do it on a TT bike because I just find it I just quite like it. I think it's quite logical, works for me. It means when I can just rock up to go and do a TT and I'm like, yeah, I'm already kind of in a good position to go and do a TT. But then I always did went into the mindset, like anything I do afterwards, I'm just doing it for fun, but there's no pressure. And I think as I've, you know, I'm very conscious that I haven't done the National 24 for four years it'll be this year and there's there, there's a couple of reasons for it and one of them was the last time I did it I did like an under 30 distance record and I was like cool and I, I thought I am not going to be able the jump up from me at 29 to then me at uh 30 plus I was like that's that will not happen in a year so I don't need to do a race like to be competitive, I was like, I don't need to do this race for at least a couple of years because I'm not going to be able, there's no way I can be competitive. The jump up in one year is not doable. In five years though, completely doable. Um, so I think my when I sort of stepped away a bit from that and I started going more into 
off road, kind of unintentionally. Uh, I think my mindset just sort of went on the route of like, do you know what? I'm just going to book in several challenges or races over the course of the year. And the reason why several was because it means that I'm not putting that pressure on that one has to go to plan. You know, I can't, if there's one race, I'm not putting all my eggs in that one basket. Like this year, for example, I've got Atlas Mountain race in the start of February. And and like, I, I've already, I said to my partner uh, this morning, I was like, the, the flight times to Morocco are really weird. So I'm flying out on the 28th of January. The race starts on the 3rd of February. And that's, that's quite a long time. It's the same time zone. But the reason why I'm flying out so much earlier is because the next flight is the 3rd of February. And I was like, okay, fine. But then the next, the, the race finishing date is the 11th of February. Now, 14th of February is Valentine's Day, going back full circle bullshit holidays um, <laughs> so but my partner booked us dinner a really lovely little restaurant near our town on valentine's day and the next the flight choices that i had were the 11th of february or the 14th of february <laughs> so i was like fuck it i'll book it for the 11th of february and if i don't if i don't finish the race by the 10th of february i'm just scratching wherever i am i'm scratching pull out get home because it's not I also know that my off-road handling is nowhere near as good a lot. It's okay. Like, I'm all right, but I'm not amazing. And the people that are going to be in the top proportion of these off-road races, they are like former European cross-country mountain bike champs. Like, they know how to ride a bike off-road. In contrast, like, I'm all right. I used to do a bit of cyclocross when I was a bit younger. I used to mountain bike as a kid. I'm okay. I'm not amazing. I'm not stupid. Um but I also prefer doing the off-road ultras to the road ones because you just, I think you see a lot more than you would see on the road. I think the, the environments and stuff. And I feel safer, to be honest, doing it off-road. So I've, I've never actually done a road ultra and I, I don't think I want to. And I, but, but the irony is, is I know if I did a road ultra, I'd probably do better at it than I would doing an off-road one. Um, But there's like, as I say, my mindset's kind of gone, well, you know what, there's Atlas Mountains is it's February, it's so early on in the year, like the winter in the UK is tough. And like, I'm I'm definitely not going into it in the position if I, if I wanted to, I'd prefer to be me in summer, me, not me in February, after my birthday, and Christmas, kind of just like sort of getting sickness bugs that everyone seems to get over Christmas and just going like, oh, fuck it, I'm going out there and seeing what happened. Like, my mindset's kind of, and it, it's good because it's meant my mindset's just gone. It's an adventure. Like, I mean, it's an adventure where I've got to do 200 plus K every day to finish in time, but it's an adventure still, you know, mm. um, and I get to sleep in a ditch. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> but there's, well, yeah, I mean, go on, you, uh, so I was, I was going to say like, you know, my mindset is then going, looking at the year in total and going, so that's that's there, and then then I have Grand Guanche in uh, March, which basically every the last I was supposed to have done the last three versions of it, but I've otherwise forgotten about a wedding, had COVID, or forgotten about a wedding twice. I think it was, so I've had to like delay it, um, and that's across the Canary Islands. But that one's very positioned as not being a race, which I quite like. Um, it's a race across an island to get a ferry. Race across an island to get a ferry, uh, and then, then, then basically, then, then I've got a charity project which I'm going to do in the summer, which is that kind of like the focus for the year. But then after that, it's like I've got Badlands again. Literally, Badlands for me is I just really enjoy it. I really enjoy that race. Done it through. It'll be my third time. I'm going to go do it on a mountain bike because it'll be just a different feel. And then I go to Chile to do across Andes. So like it's to me, it's like. I I know that if I went all in for one of them, I'd probably do quite well, but I probably wouldn't enjoy it. And I'd rather enjoy the year, experience these different countries, these different environments, see these different places, whether that's, you know, in the UK or wherever it is. And ultimately I, I race like uh, results aren't a driver for me. They really aren't like, it's about, sharing the journey and the experience and 
trying to inspire other people to do it and like show the shit side of it as well as the good side of it and if i do all right i do all right but you talk to me like it talked to me five years ago and it wouldn't have been that at all completely different mentality i'm old now so so back then it would have been i want to nail it i want to like yeah do the best i can yeah yeah i mean i'm i'm in i suppose i'm in that like transition period like i'm still the right side of 30 just um just (laughs) um but but, yeah um another, another year another two years um but but yeah like when i decided to break away from like the team aspect of professional racing or you know what most people would call it then um I was a little bit like, do I still stay competitive? And if so, like how? Uh, but then how do I like keep the fun aspect there? And a little bit, I suppose, I've had to try and balance it as much as I can, but I would still say I'm mainly competitive more than like I'm doing things more for like the fact that they push me or I need to push myself to do the things that I want to do. Um, I also feel like I won't be, well, I won't say like I won't be this age forever, obviously, but I won't be this fit forever. So, you know, coming off the back of me racing at that level, I kind of want to hold on to it or develop it for as long as I can. And if that's for another five years, then I want to, try and do something with that you know people still keep coming to me about the everesting idea um even though that's gone a little bit hush hush like you know the last time it was broken was a long time ago and obviously you know a couple of people have tried to break it since then people think it's unbreakable etc etc so there's there's things that are like there in Mm. the distance but haven't been brought into view yet and you know, I'm conscious that as we're all getting older, we, but I am trying to lay my hands on things before that time comes when I want to be able to do, you know, the sackle of the KOM anymore. Uh, or rather, I won't be able to, you know, beat my PR up there. Um, yeah. You know, because everybody tries to, well, most people that go out there, they try and chase their PR. Um, but I know that, you know, even in 10 years time, I'll be looking at that time and going, yeah, I'm never going to beat that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's like, I think that the difference as well is like you, you've cycled for a lot longer than I have cycled and you've cycled at a very high level. So there's, there's that competitive level aspect is very sort of, it's part of you as a person now the difference is i i would say is i'm competitive but i'm only competitive myself i'm not really competitive with other people uh unless it's board games don't get me on uh, don't get me started on board games but like i'm competitive with what and i think this has come with age more than anything because like when i was doing the more time trialing i was definitely more competitive with other people but also time trialing no one actually cares about your time apart from you so it's kind of it's a weird juxtaposition. But then I I also on the flip side know with the stuff that I do, the longer endurance stuff, I could be doing this till I'm 50. Like like I'm I could still actually be competitive at it, you know, which is the funny thing. Like I always think like Mark Beaumont's a mate of mine. He's 40, is he 40 or 41? I can't remember. He's 40 something. That guy is pretty damn good at bikes, you know. He's pretty good at bikes and he's not slowing down. He's, if anything, he's going faster. Um, so there's, I think it's a very, I think you, I mean, you're completely right with like the Sacalabra KOM. That's, I mean, to set the time you did, first of all, is nuts. It's, it's nuts. And then to only have one person ahead of you who happens to probably be the biggest or going to be the biggest name in British cycling of his generation, let's say, to have that as the only person ahead of you, like that's 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 big. It's big. Well, 
I, I would I would I would hit the tennis ball back at you by saying that um most pros could probably beat my time, but they haven't uh, they haven't done it, which you could see that in two ways. You could say, well, yes, but they haven't, or um, you know, they don't really care. Um, but I'm under no illusion that you know I did that like quite fresh, and you know most most professional riders could do that um, blindfolded, or at least most of the the climbers then. Um, but you know I'm hoping that's just the tip of the iceberg um, because there's a couple of like ideas that I have floating around about like what Tom's done with with Sakalobra like the fact that um the fact that he went there and you know took the KOM you know obviously shaved two minutes off which is a huge time um mm-hmm. and people say well you know that's it that's that's light work nobody's gonna beat that again um but I don't think like that you know I think it's certainly beatable mm-hmm. it just depends um who you have in front of you um yeah, you know I that's mean, the point <laughs> I, I I don't I, I have an opportunity where um you know I could put a motorbike in front of me and we could just do it for a laugh and see how close we could get to it because that's what it's going to take for me to beat that KOM me to have a motorbike in front of me now if I do take it behind a motorbike I will make a thing about it and say I'm not going to upload that that's not like I'm not going to do it more to pace behind a motorbike uh, officially um, but it would be cool to see what it would take to you know beat the time like that um, completely completely I completely agree um, but yeah, it, you know, the, but to me, you know, Sakharov is the tip of the iceberg, hopefully, and, um, you know, see, see what we can get to and see what we can challenge ourselves with on, on the longer climbs. And, you know, again, it won't just be, it, it's not kind of about the KOM is the KOM, um, you know, and like I said earlier about like the pros and how, you know, Remco could turn up, Jonas could turn up, Paul could turn up, and they would all go faster than than my time. Definitely, well, definitely go faster than my time. Would they go faster than Tom's time? You know that that would be a cool thing to see. Um, but but I think it's all it always comes back to like for me anyway, testing myself. And when I was racing, I never really got the obviously you get the chance to race against some great guys and push yourself against them. But it's just the nature of like what what Strava, I suppose, you know, what that platform has given us in a sense is is you can. It doesn't matter if it's you. Doesn't matter if it's a weekend warrior. Um, doesn't matter if it's me. We can post a time on any segment in the world, and we can see how we stack up against anybody. Um, and, and it's it's a great fa- It's a great feature that. As well, since because there was a period when Strava kind of was new, I guess, where no pro was uploading onto Strava. And I think now, because you can hide power and heart rate, stuff like that, if you want to, you're seeing more pros uploading onto it. And that's where it's become fantastic because it's opened up that thing where we can, you know, mere mortals in some way, shape or form can compare themselves to the best of the best in the world. And now... It's interesting you say about other pros could beat the time. I'm sure, yeah. But there's, as you sort of also said, there's that element of they haven't tried. So it doesn't matter until they've tried. You're still second behind Tom Pickock. Yeah, true. Yeah, it's it's very funny. Like um, the UK hill climbing scene, to bring it back like full circle, is um, is quite a, you know, if you're inside the scene, it's a very dynamic and like very sort of, it's like one big party almost. Um, their Facebook page or something else. But like, uh, it's kind of like, they always say things like, how does that saying go like, oh, you know, Ronaldo can score a scream of a goal in the World Cup, but can he do it on a wet Wednesday in Stoke or something? Like that's yeah. the, that, that saying... Well, they have a saying in hill climbing that's quite similar where, you know, like why 
why why aren't any of the UK pros turning up and doing the UK hill climbs? Like, is it? It might be because it's off season for them and they don't yeah. race. But but there is that like question. Um, you know, people do like people would like to see that. People would like to see. Well, the year I won on Hay Tour in 2019, the rumor was that Hugh Carthy was going to do it um, mm. because it was a longer climb. Uh, and, you know, obviously the longer the climb, I think the more tempting it is for the pros because there becomes a wider, um, you know, time gap between between riders, simply. Mm. Um, so, but but I think, you know, possibly there's there's that element of like... Ooh, like what if I get beaten by an amateur? Um, you know, uh, and there's that element to a professional cyclist who could be like, I don't think I could, I could turn up to a like a, a hill climb in the UK and like get beaten by someone who you know works at wherever for a mm-hmm. living and and like doesn't ride a bike. So I think in that respect, um you know, the hill climb scene has developed a lot of riders and just like the time trialing scene has, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of riders have come through the young Tarling, for example, you know, Josh Tarling from around my neck of the woods, it, such a strong time trialist uh, and has done loads of time trials, you know, ever since he was a little nipper. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think he's done many hill climbs, but I think it's like, it's one of those like sides of, British cycling, but not the British cycling that we know. I'm just yeah. using the term British cycling um, scene that I think could grow in, in massive popularity. We've seen the photos from the Nationals last year, how many people are on there. And I think when you look at the the sort of what the top 10 are doing performance-wise, and you know, yes, we're doing it completely fresh with no fatigue in our legs, but like the the numbers are off the charts, and you know if you have a young rider who's coming through and they want to get involved in like those competitive juices, then it's a really like low barrier of entry, like even lower than time trial to a certain extent because you don't need the the faster equipment. Well, you don't need the fast equipment anyway in time trialing, but certainly with hill climbing, the hill climbs are short enough you could still or long enough where you could still potentially win. Even if your bike's a little bit heavier than everybody else's, um, yeah. It's I, I I would agree that I've always I always thought time trialing was a great way into competitive cycling, but now having done a hill climb, I think that's a better way into competitive cycling because of because of the the safety aspect of it. I think hill climbs are a lot safer. Um, you know, time trialings a lot of these CTT time trial circuits when they were set up however many years ago some of them are now the roads are probably not as busy as they are now and that's why we're seeing certain circuits no longer being used because the roads are getting too busy too fast too dangerous and unfortunately we've seen it feels like every year there's more and more deaths in time trials and which is generally speaking you know you could argue it's driver's fault rider's fault that, that i won't go into that it could be any way really but it's a tragedy still that has happened now hill climbing the road's closed you know that's great you're going up a hill so you're not necessarily going like 50 kilometers an hour plus whatever it is on the tt circuit um yes there's some there's some of the same rules have been sort of taken over so you haven't have front and rear lights having to wear helmets I'm fine with that. Like, it's a consistent. Of of course, some people are going to go and strip out the innards of their helmets and just put the lightest possible light that they can find. But that's also fine, and that's quite fun. I I like that. I love that hill climbing has that almost slightly DIY-esque side of it. Like, fuck it, I'm chopping my handlebars. Like, I love, or cutting the shifters short. I love all that to save a couple of grams. Um, Yeah, how do you explain that to (laughs) Savella? Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought that the handlebars would be nice a bit shorter. <laughs> but there's I, I would say that as a way of being able to compare as a if you're like a younger rider, a lot of these hill climbs have got uh junior uh junior end like races and stuff like that, which you can compete into. I know that um the struggle had a like a junior version and like an under 23 competition everything like that men's women's etc etc 
And I think if you're a younger rider, that that's a fantastic way to get involved into a competitive side of cycling. I really do, especially in the UK. And as you say, it doesn't really matter on what your bike is. Like for flipping hell, I, I had a mate that did, well, I've had a, the one that's on Swain's Lane. I've known people to do it on a Brompton. I've known someone to do it on a BMX. Like people, the yeah. crowd and everything, people don't, if you turn up on a Brompton, people are going to go nuts for you. You turn up on a BMX, people are going to go even more nuts for you as opposed to someone turned up on some crazy lightweight bike. Like, do it on a cargo bike. Like, that'd be a good one. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, well, whatever it takes to get Francis to enter the struggle next year, then... Um... Oh, mate. Because <laughs> <laughs> when I saw when I saw that you were obviously there and yeah. then I saw Francis' video, I was like, oh, come on. Like <laughs> you were there and you didn't ride it. <laughs> you could have literally done it. The problem with Francis is he is uh he I and he can call me out on this at any point, and I don't care if he does. I think he is scared that he won't be able to do as well as he maybe would have done when he was racing. But he didn't do it when he was racing. Exactly. He didn't do hill climbs. <laughs> that, that was exactly my argument. Never did hill climbs. So, But I think there's a perception of be, what, like if he properly trained to do it, he could be quite good. Like he could, he's like when he was racing, um, you know, in the UK racing scene properly, he was very good. He was very good. Yeah. And if he um, decided he wanted to focus on something like that, I think he could do very well. But I also think Francis uh, doesn't want to do that <laughs> and just wants to make nice videos and then take the piss out of other people suffering, which is equally fine. Equally fine. Um, yeah, that, no, yeah, yeah, without without his videos, like, again, you know, that, that shine in a light, you know, what he did um, for that event, that, that shone a light as well on, on the atmosphere and how, uh, how immense that is because there's no doubt about it like the the way like it's starting to reach like far and wide like people are seeing like is this the tour de france like no it's yeah. just the national hill climb championships or something like they see the, the the crowds on the side of the hill and they just think it's somewhere in europe yeah. um or, or a big bike race um so yeah like what, what like and and like one of his videos blew up as well I don't know whether what it's on now, but I think when I reached out to him, it was at like two hundred and fifty thousand, uh, and it was just weighing people's bikes at that yeah. hill climb. Uh, and he was like, "Yeah, I didn't expect it to to blow up, but and I was like, no, well, that's a brilliant, you know, it's brilliant because you you're showing the a sport that like even five years ago was pretty small, yeah, um, or you know, part of the sport that was pretty small. So yeah." It's quite, we, um, when he was weighing all the bikes as well, like we, we weighed the Sabello that I was on. So the, it's an R5, the previous version, one of the, uh, dimension data, dimension data, uh, cobbled. It's a cool looking bike. And it's my, I, I bought that bike. I bought it. I saved up for a very long time for that bike. Cause when they released it, I was like, that's the coolest bike in the world. I want one. And I couldn't afford it. So I saved up for years for it. And I found it in New York, in the back of a shop in New York called RNA Cycles. If anyone's ever heard of that one, and walked into the shop, saw it hanging up, and I was like, "I'll take it." And the, I was like, oh, I, "I could probably, I could probably just about afford it now." And uh, the guy was like, "What do you mean you could take it?" I was like, "Can you make sure it's in a box so I can fly it home with me?" And he was like, "Yeah, that's fine." So that that's the story of that bike. Um, but anyway, that's that frame set is apart from like the bellows uh like the r5 da uh the like the super super light r5s that they made that is the lightest um disc brake sabello sabello i've ever made that frame is it's lighter than the current edition but where it the difference between the current edition and that one is comfort it is super stiff which is part of how it's so light and they the the newer one, they made it a little bit heavier to bring the comfort back, but it still is way under the UCI weight limit. Um, 
anyway, so we weighed weighed mine at the hill climb. I can't remember if Francis put it in the video or not. And we weighed it with, you know, big Garmin 1040, big GoPro on it, pedals, lights, everything like that. And it was seven point something, seven point something. And like the GoPro weighs so much and the massive Garmin weighs so much as well in the scale of it. So yeah, I've that's put... half a kilo. That's half a kilo right there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so I've then gone down this like ridiculous rabbit hole <laughs> of trying to get this bike as light as I can, but still making it completely usable. Um, so not chopping the bars, still got bar tape on, uh, and I've got it to 5.8 kilos now. But I haven't changed the handlebars and I haven't changed the stem. So it's still got like pretty, it's got aero bars on it and an aluminium stem. Decent. And a normal seat post, like a normal, uh, not seat post. And yeah, like the standard seat post that comes with it, but like a normal saddle, it's 5.8. So that's pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and I reckon I'm going to be able to get it because I'm purely doing this as a project for the National Hill Climb this year. And uh, I'm not going to be light, but the bike's going to be light. Um, well, that's what most people, that's most people's train of thought. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so the, I reckon I can get it very, very close to five for a disc brake road bike. Yeah, well, I was just about to say, yeah, you said the word disc. Um, <laughs> what did you get yours down, your factor to? Um, good question. I think it was, was it 5.6 or 5.7? I think that rings a bell. Um, but the, yeah, I suppose that's about as light as it would go without changing like drastically because it's one of the lightest skeleton like the frame frame set rather super light and yeah. i can definitely you know feel it when i'm climbing there's um, not much more you could do to it unless you were going to go down the route of silly expensive bars and stems and stuff because it's got what's it got the factors one piece black ink stuff yeah you've already got super light wheels the yeah frame, you know, the frame is so light anyway right yeah, but people 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 have said you know you can optimize the um the tire setup, um you know because I suppose once you go so far, you then have to think about well you can think about it anyway you don't have to take it to the limit with weight but you know rolling resistance, mm -hmm. um and whatnot uh but it's quite funny I did a hill climb prior to the national hill climb championships last year. Uh, and it was down in Bristol, and there was a guy there with a four. What was it four point nine kilos? Uh, his bike was like complete Frankenstein bike. It was rim brick, um, and a lot of people would be shouting at me. You need rim. You need rim. Yeah. Well, the the bike was complete like Frankenstein, but he he had exposure. Those trace. Those trace are. Like they're really small, like daytime, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, they're like 80 grams each. Yeah. So yeah, heavy. But I was run fits the heavy. <laughs> yeah. And, and and I looked at his bike and I was like, wow, this is this is super lightweight. And then I showed him mine. I told him the weight. And then like I showed him the lights. And my lights were like three Bs from the Marmot uh, Grand Fondo. Yeah. And they were like six grams each. And he looked at my lights. He said, "Where did you get those from?" I said, "They were just free," uh, and he was he couldn't believe like like how small they were. And I hadn't done anything to I hadn't because some people had bought coin cell uh, yeah. rear and front lights and stripped them so they were like if any water got on them, well they'd be dead. Yeah. Um, but but mine were actually like fully functioning with plastic on and everything. So those um, little ones that have got the like rubber strap on them, are they? Yeah. Yeah, they're great. Um, and like, as long as I don't use them too much, because I think like they're they're like single use, which is not great for the environment, you know. But the, as long as I don't use them too much, then I'll never have to ch uh, get rid of them or 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 whatever, because I'll only be using them a couple of times a year. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I don't, I I kind of, you know, factor or the relationship I have with the guys over at Verez Velo over in Norfolk, that they they've been like 
absolutely class with me to be fair and because it's more of a it's more of a package um you know with the bike fit and and like the whole experience they have over there is a bit more than just buying a bike mm-hmm. um and uh and the bike that i've been using all year uh you know the o2 van it's it's done me on you know super long rides it's done me on you know sakurab kom it's done me proud at the national hill climb championships and like you said earlier about like kind of compromising when you go like too low mm-hmm. you know where where the sacrifice is then so this bike has you know served me well everywhere i've been able to do um everything on it and that's kind of that's kind of like where we were focusing our energy last year was you know let's try and give you something that you can use everywhere as opposed to building something that's so light that you can only bring it out like once a month or something yeah um you know who knows maybe further down the line that's that's an option we go down but you know for the time being the cost per use would be very low currently yeah exactly it's it's good that uh, you know and that bike is a it's an o2 van isn't it you said yeah so like it's is as as we've already said it's a super lightweight frame as it is but it's a little bit aero you know it is kind of a very good kind of all-round bike and i think factor bikes are great bikes i've, I've always been a fan like one of my best mates has got an o2 rim which is now quite old and quite battered but it's just a classic looking bike it's cool it's a great bike um and it's great seeing that they're still you know with israel premier tech is that what the team's called now it's really cool that they're there still they've, it's nice seeing they've done some really nice collaborations with different people as well which is cool like i've always thought factor are a cool brand and it's great that they're they've supported you in not just providing you a bike but also the experience and everything as well to help you know bike bike fits are I'm the biggest believer that bike fits are the one of the biggest benefits that everyone could have from bike riding. Like, Jesus, go get a bike fit, please, whoever you are. But it doesn't matter. Like, there's so many good bike fitters in the UK, but it will, if you haven't had one, it will just revolutionize your cycling. You might realize that you're on a bike that's two sizes too big. That's the common one I keep hearing. Like, someone, like I, I did that. My first bike was a size 58 and I ride a 54. Yeah, I, I remember I was listening to a podcast you were doing with uh, Darren Franks and you were talking about frame sizes there. Um, yeah. And I got a funny story about Darren uh, that um, I could probably share it really quickly. But he, I first met him when we did the Moonrakers and Sunseekers or Dax, I think it was, which was 300k through yeah. the night uh, from Bristol down to... Uh, uh, the south coast of England and blanking on the name of the name of the town. It was a seaside town, which obviously they all are in it. But um, <laughs> the the um, it was three hundred k, so one hundred and fifty k south to then one hundred fifty k back north. But we left Bristol at like ten pm, and I've been in touch with him and uh Chris Herbert, I think yeah. his name was, yeah. yeah. And, and they both rode it. And so I tagged along because it was like a November. It was freezing cold. It rained the whole night. Sounds and, about right for an old act, eh? Yeah. And and we we just like plowed on. Um, you know, with an old axe, you obviously have to stop and get your um breve stamped. Um and then I just remember like the boys telling me that they'd driven from London that evening after work. Uh, Chris was very sleepy. And I think about 2 a.m. was like on the front because there was just the four of us at the time. And we were somewhere like on the Salisbury Plains or wherever. And it was like <laughs> seeing Chris on the front in his aero bars, like weaving sort of just not like a severe weave, but it was enough that you were noticing that like something wasn't quite right. And every so often, I think um, Darren was having to shout at him to keep him awake. Uh, but it, that was an experience that I'll never forget. Um, not least because of the weather, but 300k in about 10 hours. Um, and yeah, uh, that was my experience with Darren. <laughs> <laughs> Darren's a very lovely guy. Uh, and he's also like someone who is 
annoyingly good on a bike. Like, considering his level of riding, the amount of riding he now does with his young with his young boy compared to what he was doing is quite a lot lower, and he's still very, very good. He's annoyingly good. But you look at him, and he's just the physique of a cyclist. That's all I think of when I look at him. Like, he's tall, he's, like, long-limbed. He just looks like a cyclist. But... Yeah, there's the, it's, it's one of the, as I think, as we've kind of spoken about a few times, is what is so lovely about cycling is that there is that diversity. You can do different things. You're not, you, as you say, you've done hill climbs, you've been national champion, but you've mixed it up and done other things. You know, you've been doing some bike packing, been doing some gravel stuff, some cyclocross. Like, that's what's really great about cycling is yes, it's a niche sport, but there's so many different niches in that niche sport that really allow people to just try and do different things. Like I, I, I'm a big believer that if you start getting bored of one thing, just do a different thing on a bike. Like, and so I'd go ride a mountain bike. If I get fed up with the mountain bike, go on a road bike, you know, if I get fed up with the road bike, go on the gravel bike. If I get fed up on that, I go on the TT bike. After that, it's just keep changing it, keeping, keeping your motivation and excitement up because at the end of the day, they're big kids toys, right? Like that's all it is, big kids toys. And we're yeah. lucky to get to ride around and have fun on them. Yeah, it always makes me laugh when people say, uh, oh, I'm, I'm not very good at cycling. And I always think to myself, like, there's lots of sports where you have to be very good at one thing specifically. So if you're a 100 meter runner, like, you're very good at that. Mm. Uh, and it would be very difficult for you to go and run a marathon. You know, you'd be able to do it, but, you know, you won't be able to do it to the same standard. Um, likewise, a marathon runner running 100 meters. But with cycling is like even if you've come into it late and you know maybe you're in your 50s and you're just discovering like gravel riding which is a perfect example a guy who i'm riding with now he's been doing time trialing virtually his whole life mm. and he's sort of slowly fallen out of love with it because as he's got older he's not been able to keep up the training and he's starting to get slower and all this sort of stuff and now he's found gravel riding and he's like riding longer in terms of hours um, on these gravel rides because it doesn't feel like you're riding. Like, you know, you go for a two hour road ride and on a gravel ride, it's like four hours. Like yeah. it, it just doesn't feel the same. Um, and yeah, he's getting to a point in his life now where he's like, oh, I could like go up to Scotland and I could do like a couple of these long like gravel events that are like over a good few hours. And like, I'd be half decent at that. And I'd be like, yeah, like, you know, you've now found something at different stages of your life that's yeah. in the same sport that you're now half decent at. Like, and he has, it's just blown his mind. It's fantastic, isn't it? We're very lucky. We're very lucky. Um, I think stories like that is, you know, it, it seems to be quite common where people get very stuck in a rut on a, on a very specific aspect of cycling and I, and like i'm a huge believer in don't pigeonhole yourself like unless you're like going to the olympics or the tour de france damn well pigeonhole yourself yeah fair enough but like if you're you know so like i don't want to say an average person because there's no such thing as an average person but you you know you're juggling work or some other kind of stuff like by all means, do a bit of road riding, do a bit of off-road, like just dabble across and see where your mood and mind takes you. And it's it'll keep you much more energized and much more like generally just positive, I think, in your outlook as well. Like there's there's definitely I think we both really have noticed and understand the benefits of going out riding, whether that's talking with mates, whether that's training, like I think similarly to you're probably quite similar to me that actually you quite enjoy having structured training stuff because I, I love having structured training. I love it It's because it's a focus, but there's so many aspects and ways that I think it's very positive on our lives and our lifestyle. And, you know, going full circle, both you and I choose to share that with people and hopefully encourage and inspire. That's always the goal, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, as cliche as it sounds, bums on bikes. Um, it's like 
whatever gets you riding, whether it be structured training or a completely uh, brand new gravel ride on a route you've never done before, where you end up riding through a river. Um, like literally, like it can be very, very far reaching. Um, and that is now weirdly either indoors or outdoors. Like the stuff that we're now able to do indoors is quite frankly mind boggling. Um, you know, whole communities exist yeah. just online on you know online training platforms, and they never touch the outdoors. And it's like that to me as well, like blows my mind. But if that's what people want to do, and crack on, it's yeah. like it's amazing. It's great. It's it's just added another um string to the bow of cycling, right? Like there's I I have no issues. Like a lot of my I was talking to a couple of my mates at the weekend and was it the weekend? Yeah, it was the weekend because they came up because they were then going to watch the national cyclocross. So they were just like, How can you sit on a turbo trainer for like two, three hours? And I'm like, it's the same. It's the same. I'm still riding a bike. Like, it, yes, maybe, maybe there's an element that you're because you, you're not absorbing or seeing or smelling or anything like that. You're very much in a in a particular place. But to me, my mindset is like, cool. I'm going for a ride for three hours. I'm gonna do it indoors because it's pissing it down outside. And I or or the recent one is it's pissing. Oh, now it's snowing. Oh, now that wind is blowing over all the plant pots in the garden. I'm not going to go outside. That's the general scale of it at the moment. And I'm like, I, I'm, I have no issues with sitting on a turbo trainer for like three, four hours or whatever, because that's like, actually, do you know, on a turbo trainer, I could do something very, very structured. I could do a group ride if I wanted to. I could do something easy. I could watch a film. That's fine. Like, it's all fine. Like, I can multitask better on a turbo trainer. Um, but, you know, <laughs> It's great that that's become something for a lot of people who are maybe, you know, more time conscious as well. Um, and we look at, there's so many different online platforms, whether it's Swift or Ruby or um, Rogue Grand Tours or whatever it is, or I can't even think of the name of them, half of them now. There's, there's just so many different options now. And they all have their own communities inside them. And that's, it's great. It's brilliant. As you said, more bums on bikes is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up there because I want to cook some dinner, to be honest. <laughs> um, and I've managed to not have any distractions from a dog, which has been great because he's he's been... He's testing at times. <laughs> Put it that way. Um, not all the time. He's been very good. He's only young, but he can be very testing. Um especially with my patients when I've had to deal with him on my own for a week while my partner's been skiing. Oh, very nice. Well, for your partner, yeah. She's had a great time. <laughs> I've had to deal with the dog. Um, Ed, thank you so much for chatting with me. It's, I, I could talk to you for ages. I, I just like you as a person, quite frankly. Um, I could talk to you for ages. And if... Uh, you don't follow Ed, like find him on YouTube, find him on social media. I'll put links in the description for this as well. And go and like check out the videos and stuff talking about the Sacalabra KOM because it's pretty cool. And it's just like, just generally like subscribe and everything to Ed because it's all really good stuff. It's really enjoyable. It's nice seeing someone who's, who comes at, who like, I've got, I'm really good mates with Francis. I'm good mates with Lawrence. You know, I've got mates who do YouTube and have done it for years. And I love what they do, but I also love what you do because I think you come at things at a different angle, which is great. I appreciate that, Chris. No, thank you so much for having me on. And uh, I hope you enjoy your meal, whatever it may be. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> whatever's awesome. in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> very organized <laughs> <laughs> nice one thank you very much thank you buddy cheers <laughs>